A, B, calculus students, it's time to get into chapter six. Here comes 6-1. Now we have trilogy every single grade, and that's the story of the evolution of Wade. So first, f of x equals x minus two quantity squared plus one on the window from zero to six, or the domain from zero to six on the x-axis. All right, so-called closed interval, right? Now, you should look at this and every calculus student should immediately say it's x squared, it's a parabola, minus two inside means right two, if you remember back in integrated three. Okay, opposite, when it's in the inside, it's opposite. So you think that could that be left? No, it's actually right two. Up one, so if you go right two, up one, and draw a U-shape right there, normally that's all you have to do. Today, we need more specific coordinates for what we're going to do today. So we'll only do this in this problem. This is the only time I would have you go back and fill out a table like you used to when you were little kids in Integrated One and you filled out a whole table, right? Well, you know how to graph. You know all the secrets because I taught you. So you don't have to do tables anymore until today. So for this one problem, I'm going to take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the integers on this closed interval and I'm gonna plug them into this equation so we can be super specific just for this lesson. So I take zero, I plug it in. Zero minus two is negative two. Negative two squared is four plus one is five. So I'm gonna aim for the point zero, five. If you plug in one, one minus two is negative one. Negative one squared, positive one. One plus one, two. By the way, try to get the answer before I do when I say it out loud, right? So you're not just regurgitating onto paper what I'm saying. Like, try to beat me to it, right? 2 minus 2, 0. Squared, 0. Plus 1, 1. Okay, hopefully I'm saying it slowly enough where you can beat me to it. 3 minus 2 is 1. 1 squared, 1. 1 plus 1, 2. Huh. The y coordinates, the f of x, right, was 5 down to 2, down to 1. Now it's coming back up again to 2. Could that be because parabolas drop and then they rise when they're concave up, that is? And could that be because it's a perfect mirror image when you do a parabola? How about 4? 4 minus 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. Plus 1 is 5. It's a mirror image. Okay, now we get some new numbers. 5 minus 2 is 3. 3 squared is 9 plus 1 is 10. And finally, 6 minus 2 is 4, 4 squared is 16, plus 1 is 17. Only for this one section in all of calculus would you actually have to graph these very specific points. And I've also provided you with a kind of a grid here, graph paper. So let's graph these super duper specific points. And then for all other sections of the year, just make it a parabola right to up one and be done with it, right? Okay, let's graph our specific points. Let's see what Mr. Wade's up to here. So zero, five, up five. All right, one, two, right one, up two. Two, one, right two, up one. Uh, three, two, right three, up two. There's the parabola rising. Four, five, right four, up five. Five, ten, right five, up ten. And 617, right 6, and up 17, a little bit above the 15 there. And let's connect the dots, and we get ourselves a nice U shape, a parabola. Oops, that point was a little bit off right there. Close enough. Okay, I kind of got a, uh, an angled parabola there. Hopefully you got a better one because you had a grid and I did not. All right, it's a parabola. It's only on 0 to 6, so it's a section of a parabola. It's a little piece right here. Now, what was this age-old question that I talked about that eventually led to a lot of our modern technology? Okay, way, way back in the BC era, they already knew this would be important. Try to find the area under the curve and above the x-axis. So let's make this into a shape. So I'm gonna go from, let's block it off at zero. Let's block it off at six. So everybody draw a vertical line straight down to six, vertical line straight down the y-axis, and we're gonna go across the x-axis. We're gonna get an enclosed region right here. Everybody see that shape? We've got some weird shape. Is that weird, parabola, sharp? Looks like a sharp kind of a knife or, or a guillotine or something. Is that weird shape a rectangle? No, 
so it's not base times height. Is that weird shape right there a circle? No, so it's not pi r squared, right? It's not a triangle, so it's not one half base times height. All those shapes we have formulas for are suddenly out the window when you get to this level of calculus. We need to find the area, and there is no formula per se to find the area of that shape. Now, you'll see a little box next to the name Eudoxus, the ancient Greek mathematician who first addressed this. We're gonna go back at the very end of the video and we're going to actually do a history break where you can go back and fill in the boxes later. This is going to be their top 100 rank. But for now, we'll, we'll save the history for the end and I'll just tell you that Eudoxus was the first one to figure out some step in this problem that would later lead to modern technology. There's no way he could have imagined like manufacturing airplanes, but that's what his work led to eventually. So this is about 370 BC. So using inscribed rectangles, estimate the area of this weird shape using delta x equals one. Now there are a couple of new things here we need to discuss. So delta x equals one means the width is going to be one. Normally we would, for width, we would say what, W? Or we would say B for base in past classes? All of a sudden you get to calculus and they're using the symbol delta x to measure the width of something, all right? So width, that's the rectangle width, equals one, all right? Later in the year, we will have a mighty revelation about delta x and the whole class is just gonna come together. You're just gonna say, oh my gosh, all that stuff you taught me about derivatives and integration and limits coming later, all of them just collide and come together and make sense, all right? So for now, just know that delta x equals one, and I'm building you up slowly for that great moment. All right, inscribed. What the heck is an inscribed rectangle? Okay, let's go over here to our picture, and an inscribed rectangle means the rectangle must fit under. We've done inscribed rectangles this year, actually. Uh, the maximum inscribed rectangle. So it has to fit under your curve, but the width has to be one. So here's what we'll do. Start from zero, because remember that's the start point. Start from zero, draw width one, and I want you to bring the rectangle up until it goes boom and bumps into the curve, okay? It's a little width one, height two is what it is. Then bring the next rectangle, width one, because it's said to, go up into the curve and straight across and down. Inscribed means it fits under the curve, right? The third rectangle comes over, up, hits the vertex, and down. Uh, I did not draw this to scale at all, but if anybody's realizing that this is a one by one, yes, that is actually a square had I drawn this to scale. It's a one by one square. So why am I saying rectangle? Because all squares are types of rectangles, okay? You may have learned that in another class. All squares are rectangles, they're just short rectangles. Okay, over, up, over, down. Okay, let's do this one. Actually, let's go up first. Up till you hit the curve, over, width one. So the only stipulations are the width must be one and the rectangle must fit into the curve. Width one, bring this up here until we hit, straight across, straight down. That is a mighty wavy rectangle right there. Hopefully <laughs> yours look a lot better than that. All right, we got six rectangles inscribed. So what did Eudoxus say way back in roughly 370 BC? He said, if we can put enough rectangles inscribed under any curve, we could get a decent approximation. They already knew pi r squared back then for circles. They already knew base times height for rectangles, but they couldn't figure out how to get the exact area of this shape. Well, it's gonna take like over 2,000 years to actually find the answer. So yeah, we were way, way off at this point. This was very primitive. So let's find the area under this shape. So the approximate area, let's say area and then the squiggly equal sign. The approximate area under the parabola is the sum of the areas of all six rectangles. Well, the first rectangle is a two by one and two times one is two plus the second rectangle is a one by one square, still a rectangle. One times one is one. The third rectangle is one by one, so that's one. The fourth rectangle is one by two, so that's two. The fifth rectangle is one by five. See, we're taking the numbers out of the table right here, right? We needed those. It's a one by five, which is five. 
All right, the biggest rectangle is a one by this 10 right here. That looks a little taller than 10, sorry, but it's a one by 10, which is an area of 10 square units, right? And then you add up all the inscribed rectangles together. And this is a question that could pop up on the AP test also, okay? So they want you to understand the history, the old way they used to do it. 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Grand total of 21 square whatevers, all right? So that's our first attempt. Now, is that an overestimation or an underestimation? Clearly, we did not fill the parabola completely with rectangles. It's an underestimation, and I actually gave you, now see, I know calculus, and so I went ahead and figured out the real answer for you. The real answer using calculus is 30, exactly 30 square units. You'd think it would be like a decimal or a fraction? Exactly 30 square units under this weird shape. So this was clearly an underestimation by a long shot. All right, but that was Eudoxus' first attempt. Does anybody know what would be better than doing six inscribed rectangles? Is anybody thinking maybe doing like, you know, 10, 15, 20, 100 inscribed rectangles might be a little bit better? The more rectangles you squeeze in there, the better you match the shape. That is true, okay? So if you're thinking more rectangles, you're right. So now we proceed to the next step, and that is circumscribed rectangles and delta x equals one. Now they do ask on the ACT, inscribed and circumscribed. So these are two words that you need to know. So inscribed means it fits inside the rectangle or inside the parabola. Circumscribed means it fits over top of this parabola. Okay, so let's try that. And this was developed by Archimedes. Now we're not gonna put his rank in the box yet. We'll wait till the end. But Archimedes figured out, let's try this idea. This is about 150 years roughly after Eudoxus. So we're gonna do, again, delta x equals one. So the rule is I have to make it width one. Now how do you draw a circumscribed rectangle? Okay, width one, you go up and you don't stop when you hit the parabola. You keep going until you get to the five. Does everybody see that this rectangle here would be the tallest rectangle you could draw but part of the roof of the building must hit the parabola. You see how it hits there at five? And the parabola is gonna go like this, right? Like it continues over here, right? If you raise the roof any more than that, you're gonna be off the parabola and you're not even estimating the parabola anymore. So circumscribed, you raise the roof. That's our new favorite game called raise the roof until the last possible moment that the roof clings to the parabola, okay? So the first one's a, a one by five. Now, the second rectangle, must be delta x equals one. So width one, and we're gonna raise the roof up to the two and go across. See how that roof still touches the parabola? So the roof must touch the parabola for everything that you do in this section right here, this whole lesson, okay? Third rectangle, delta x equals one. You're gonna raise the roof until you get up to that two right there. Let's go straight across, okay? That's as high as I can go, but I'm still touching the parabola with the roof. Don't, don't blast off the parabola. With the one, raise the roof as far as you can go. That would be up to this five right here, all right? The next one would be go over. Let me see if I can draw this any better than last time. Let me take this out. Okay, straight up to the point, over and down. That was all the way up to 10 is what that was. And then the last one's gonna be over all the way up to 17 and back down, all right? Now, you can't do this on your paper, but I have the ability on the board to kind of erase the inscribed. So now you can just focus on the circumscribed and I want you to kind of see this better. So circumscribing rectangles will actually make them fit over top of the shape. Now you might think, well, that estimation is gonna be, you know, just as bad as Eudoxus with his inscribed rectangles. True, but Archimedes came up with a little trick for parabolas that's going to blow your mind that's going to come in in another lesson, not today. But for now, you can see his idea, fit these over top of the parabola, plus a nice little breakthrough that he had. So over here, let's go ahead and do this. The area under the parabola is approximately, now the first rectangle was a one by five. One times five is five. The second one was base one height two. One times two is two. The third rectangle is a one by two. 
And then the fourth one is a mirror image, one by five. So see, those are just a mirror image of each other, all right? Or a palindrome, of those of you who know what a palindrome is, same forwards and backwards. Now, the second to last rectangle was a one by 10. The last one's a one by 17. So one times 10 is 10, and one times 17 is 17, all right? So there is how we're going to figure out the approximate area. Does everybody see this is going to be an overestimation because we're higher than the parabola? We're over. So this is going to be over the real life answer of 30, which I will show you how to get, of course. So um, let's see. Let's, well, I like, I like the puzzle pieces that fit together. 5 plus 5 makes 10. I would definitely use those rather than just adding left to right across the shape. So 5 plus 5 is 10, plus 10 is 20. 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. So it's over. Now when I show you the Archimedes trick later, you're gonna realize the genius here. But if, if we had used more, didn't we only use six rectangles? All right, we need more rectangles. If we had used like 100 rectangles, it would have been deadly accurate, almost, almost perfectly accurate. So that's how to do circumscribed, inscribed, it's a rough approximation of the area of a weird shape. But now we move on to a big historical gap if you notice the years there. Finally in the 1700s, the genius Leonard Euler comes along and says, I've got an idea. We call it the trapezoidal sum or the trapezoidal rule. Trapezoids, remember integrated three. A trapezoid is something that has one pair of parallel bases and then one pair of crooked bases that are not parallel. Okay, that's the classic trapezoid from back in the day, right? And if you put the arrows, it means parallel. Now, the trapezoids we're gonna be using today for Euler and in calculus aren't quite exactly like this. The trapezoids we're gonna use in calculus look more like this. They've got two right angles in the corner here. So it's kind of like half rectangle, half trapezoid. But no, this actually is a full trapezoid. Are the top and bottom parallel? Yes. Are the sides crooked? Yes. So this counts as a trapezoid. It just kind of looks almost rectangular-ish at the end, right? But it's not. So Euler's idea was this. Let's go back over here. Let's forget the circumscribed inscribed and try to do these trapezoids. So here's Euler's idea. Um, what is the width? Now we haven't talked about the width yet. I probably should mention that before I do this. What's this new phrase, Mr. Wade? Three equal partitions. Okay, three equal partitions. Aren't we going from zero to six in this problem, okay? So you wanna see that the overall width is six. But then partitions mean sections. We're gonna break it into three sections, all right? And sections means basically number of rectangles, except here they're trapezoids, which is why we said partitions instead of rectangles. So you've got six for the width of the entire shape from zero to six, right? divided into three sections, which we call partitions in calculus. So you simply do six divided by three and you get two. That's your so-called delta x, that's your width, okay? So just take the width divided by number of partitions, very easy. So I'm gonna use delta x equals two this time, all right? Now you also could have done delta x equals one, we're just trying to mix it up. So everybody is gonna do a width of two. I'm gonna use a different color so we can see this. I'm sure your drawing is getting a little messy now. That's okay. So width two. Now what's Euler's idea? So Eudoxus would say go up and inscribe it under, right? Then Archimedes said let's go up and actually fit it over. And then Euler said let's take this point and this point and instead of drawing a rectangle, we're gonna connect the two corners or points diagonally, like that. That makes a trapezoid. You see how the heights are parallel. It's kind of on its side. The heights are parallel. The base and this thing are crooked, okay? That's this thing on its side right here. All right, so there's Euler's idea. Look how well it hugs the curve too, right? Especially if you use not just a couple of trapezoids, but like hundreds of trapezoids. It's really going to hug the curve very well. Much better than circumscribed inscribed. Now, next shape with two, because we said delta x has to be two. We're going to go up to the parabola there. We're going to go up to the parabola there. And we're going to make a diagonal roof on our building. Like that. Okay? That's a trapezoid. Height, 
height, parallel. Base, and then the roof, crooked, trapezoid. And then finally, delta x equals 2, so we end up at 6. And then we're going to raise the roof to there, to the parabola. Raise the other roof to the parabola. Both corners of the roof, even though it's diagonal, touch the parabola. That did not happen with circumscribed and inscribed. Only one corner of the roof touches the parabola. Trapezoidal rule, or trapezoidal sum, both corners of the diagonal roof must touch the parabola. Okay? See how it's parallel, parallel, crooked, crooked. All right. Now, we have to review from integrated 3, what is the area of a trapezoid? Okay, area of a trapezoid. Well, let's do this. Let's say area of the shape under the parabola is approximately the addition of three trapezoids. Okay, so first trapezoid, the base is two, right? Base two. The height is the average because there are two different heights. So it's base times average height. Trapezoids are on the ACT, by the way. We're still doing ACT math even here in calculus, all right? Base two times the average of, what were the two heights? Five and one, right? So you add the heights together and you divide by two and that is the average height times the very consistent base because the base stays two all the way up. Okay, second trapezoid. Let's see if we can take out some of these extra marks in here so you can see this a little bit better. So, second trapezoid, base two. They're all gonna be base two because that was your delta x, by the way. So all the bases should be the same. That's what happens with delta x. Two by what? Two by, average the heights, one and five. So one plus five over two. Great to review over trapezoids today, isn't it? And then the last trapezoid is with two again, delta x times the average height, which would be the average of 5 and 17 up there, which we're getting out of the table, right? That's why we had to have the table here. So 5 plus 17 over 2. Okay, and then calculus is full of all these weird twists, and so there are things that you do just in calculus that you may not have done before, okay? It's really tempting to go ahead and cross cancel these twos and these twos and these twos. And actually, you can. You absolutely can. Here's what I really want to talk about, though, because these aren't always going to cross cancel. Okay? If your delta x is 2 and your width of each shape is 2, sure. But often, the delta x is not 2. So this is something that you can always do. Factor out the common width because you will always have a common width until we get to this one weird problem later. But for the most part, you're going to have a common width. So I want you to factor the two out, and that would probably be better because you will not always have this cross cancellation here. See, again, new things in calculus. Mr. Wade, aren't we always supposed to cross cancel? Yeah, you can. You can. But really, I'd rather you factor out the base for the future problems, okay? And then look what's left. First fraction is 6 over 2 plus second fraction is 6 over 2, plus third fraction, 17 plus 5 is 22 over 2. All right, so you end up with 2 times, and now, of course, could you just make 6 over 2, 3, and 6 over 2, 3, and 22 over 2, 11? You could, right? But again, that's not always going to happen. You're very frequently going to have like 7 over 2, 9 over 2, things like that. I'd rather, again, just put it all together with a common denominator. So that's 6 and 6 is 12. And then 12 plus 22 is 34 over 2. So you, you want to take advantage of the common denominator in the future. And then now, once you get to the end, and you've got 34 over 2 times 2, okay, now you would cross cancel if you could. And if you can't, you won't. And you get 34. Okay? Many ways to get there, but I'm just telling you heads up in the future, you're going to be factoring the base out in many cases, all right? And you're going to be keeping your common denominator in many cases. Okay, so anyway, however you get there is fine. 34, hey, the real answer over here is 30 using calculus, and we only used three partitions. 
The other two problems, A and B, we used six little partitions. Not bad for only using three partitions, and it's been the best estimation so far. That's how good the trapezoidal rule is. Now, let's flip it over on the back page where I've redrawn the image for you, just because we mucked up the other one, right? So now we can kind of get a fresh start. Same image, same graph, area equals 30 exactly using calculus, which we'll eventually get to. And now insert to one of our top 20 mathematicians who we'll talk about at the history break when we get to the end, Georg Riemann. And Georg Riemann was German. Uh, in, uh, in Nashville, we would call him George Riemann, but he was Georg Riemann in Germany, and he came up with a brilliant, brilliant idea. Definitely one of the most brilliant mathematicians to ever walk the face of the earth. So he has an idea for a midpoint sum and three equal partitions. Okay, you know what? This is a great time actually for me to teach you a little bit of calculus lingo here. Okay, you'll want to remember this for later. So remember we're going from zero to six. Let's go ahead and block that off there. So let's block off zero is there. Six is here, well, close enough. And then we'll do the x-axis. And now you've got a shape, right? This weird, very sharp thing here that's probably being manufactured somewhere, right? And of course, all this goes into manufacturing. So you've got this space. We're trying to solve this world challenge. How do you get the area under the curve, the area of anything? Well, Riemann was actually the one who cracked it. He was the one who finally solved it in the 1800s. So here's one idea he presented. A midpoint sum, sometimes called the midpoint rule. So we've got three equal partitions. The left boundary is zero, the right boundary is six. Okay, here's your calculus lingo. We call that A equals zero and B equals six. So A, B represent the boundaries of a shape that you're trying to find the area under. That's the only time we use this notation, okay? And then one more thing, N. N is the number of rectangles, or for Euler trapezoids, but N is the number of sections. Well, it says three equal partitions. So that's the number of shapes we're going to have. Wasn't the last problem trapezoidal sum, right? And didn't we say three equal partitions and we got three sections of equal width, okay? That's what the equal means. So uh, you'll want to remember this. Don't we need delta x? We just did this in the trapezoidal sum, but I'm going to show you the formal way to write this. Delta x, the width of each, these are rectangles, by the way, again. Okay, not trapezoids. The width of each rectangle shall be B minus A over N. That's kind of what you did in your head when you did the trapezoidal rule, okay? B minus A over N. What is B minus A? That would be six minus zero. But what is that actually telling you? Isn't that giving you the width of the entire thing? You know what? Talk about linking this back to five dash one. Horizontal distance. How wide is the shape? Right x minus left x. That's what that's giving you. So that's telling you that your weird sharp image up here is six across, but we're gonna divide it into three partitions. N equals three, which goes there. Oh, so you're just saying how wide is the shape and let me chop it into three sections, which means delta x equals two, just like in the trapezoidal rule, okay? Now this, little formula right here, you'll want to just file that away. You don't need to use it in chapter five, but I want you to put that in your brains because we're going to get back to that in the second semester on a much, much higher level, okay? You'll want to remember this day for sure, all right? So there you go, two. Now let's play the game. Midpoint rule, midpoint sum, all right. Delta X is two, the width must be two. So I'm going to draw a rectangle from zero to two with two. Now raise the roof, it's our new favorite game. Midpoint sum, huh. Do I raise the roof until I bump into the parabola? No, that would be inscribed. Do I raise the roof all the way to five so it fits over the parabola? No, that would be Archimedes circumscribed method. I raise the roof until the middle of the roof, the midpoint of the roof contacts the parabola. If I'm drawing my rectangle from zero to two, so to there, what's in the middle of zero and two? One. What's above one? 
the point one comma two, the roof must hit that point right there. So to hit that point, I've got to go across two, raise the roof until I get to right there, go across and down. Now I want you to see the genius of this method. Do you see how the middle of the roof contacts the parabola? Do you see how it's a little bit of an overestimation, but then it's also an underestimation? So it's both over and underestimating the curve at the same time. Not perfectly, of course. That region is not identical to the size of this little sharp triangle right here. So it does, it's not a perfect balance, but it's a pretty darn good method, all right? Now, of course, he had a later breakthrough that would lead to the exact area. We haven't gotten there yet, but this was the beginning of his research. Now, delta x equals two again. So I've got to go over another two. And halfway between two and four is the three. So above the three is where I must hit the parabola. You see how this is gonna go across two and it's gonna go up, over, and line up with the other one, okay? And that is a what? That's a two by two square. It's still a rectangle, but it's just a super short rectangle called a square. And then finally, what's halfway between four and six, that would be five. So we're gonna go up from five, Cover that dot right there. That is uh, five comma 10 from our table. And we're gonna raise the roof. So we're gonna go across two. We're gonna raise the roof until we get to a level of 10. Go across, go straight down through that coordinate and then down to there, all right? And you can see it's a little over and a little under and it will be an approximate balance and give you a pretty good estimation of the area under the curve. So area, is approximately, the first one's a two by two, so that makes four, plus the second one's a two by two, that makes four, and the third one is a two by 10, which makes 20, and you add them together and you get 28. Hey, the real answer is 30. That's pretty close, and that was only three rectangles. That wasn't even six rectangles like earlier, right? And this led to Riemann cracking the case for the exact area under or inside any shape on the planet. Even like a lake, you know, or a pond that has like a weird border to it, right? I mean, everything. Now, your boy Eudoxus, back in the old days, you know, 370 BC, there's no way he could have envisioned like creating airplanes and manufacturing cars and things like that using this technology. Of course, Riemann was living in the mid 1800s, so he absolutely could see the impact it was gonna have on manufacturing and engineering. And that brings us to Riemann's subsequent idea of using a left-hand sum. Now, what does that mean? Okay, first of all, we've had three different types of lingo that popped up today. Number one, we had the notation delta x equals, and that's the width. Number two, we had equal partitions, which means sections. And then the third way they could ask it on the AP test is six rectangles. They're just straight up telling you the number of rectangles, all right? But you still need to find the width delta x. So remember, delta x equals b minus a over n. All right, so B minus A is still six minus zero. That's not gonna change. Not in this problem, it won't. Now, N, break it into six partitions or rectangles. They could have used the word partitions also. Partitions, sections, rectangles, and six divided by six is one. So what they mean, obviously, is do with one all the way through. Okay, now, what is a left-hand sum? So using delta X equals one, we're gonna go from zero to one. So our first base is with one. All bases will be with one. Left-hand sum, so Riemann said, let's draw the rectangle so that when you raise the roof, not that he used that lingo, the left corner of the roof must touch the parabola. Okay, you see this? So the left corner hits the parabola. Okay, next rectangle, delta x equals one. So one to two left corner must touch the parabola. Okay, this one's right over top of this one. This one's 
it's, it doesn't matter now, right? Now, next one, delta x equals one. Two to three, raise the roof so that the left corner hits right on that vertex of the parabola, right there. This one is now insignificant. Okay, three to four, delta x equals one. Raise the roof until you hit the parabola on the left corner. All the left corners must hit the parabola. Delta x equals one. Raise the roof until the left corner bumps into five. Take that out so you can see this a little bit better. And the final rectangle, width one, delta x equals one. Raise the left side of the building until the left corner bumps into the parabola. And you can see that a left-hand sum is actually a mixture between a little overestimation and then a little underestimation. And they balance out to give a pretty decent approximation. Honestly, not as good as the midpoint, but that's not the point here. No pun intended, all right? This, defining the left-hand corners, is what led to Riemann's big breakthrough. Right? Not the midpoint sum, that just led to the left-hand sum, then the left-hand sum led to the breakthrough of what is the exact area of any shape on the planet. All right? So what do we have? First rectangle, one by five. So the area under the parabola is approximately the sum of the six rectangles. One by five is five. All right, this is a one by two, which is two. This is a one by one square, which is also a rectangle, area one. This is one by two, which is two. This one's one by five, which is plus five. And that's a one by 10, which is 10. All right, I like the, uh, the five plus five is 10. I like to fit them together my puzzle pieces here. Five plus five is 10, plus 10 is 20, 22, 24, 25. All right, is that a better estimate than the midpoint sum? No, because 25 was our answer. The real answer is 30, which I'll show you in the next lesson. And then 28 is the midpoint sum answer, which was better. But again, that's not the point. The point is that Riemann was the first one to determine that everything should be justified to the left corner uniformly throughout, and that's going to lead to the big breakthrough that he actually presented for his PhD. How about that? Okay, so now he also said you could justify to the right corner, and that is our last problem of the day. Do a right-hand Riemann sum. Sometimes these are called Riemann sums, by the way. All right, so letter F, we're gonna do a right-hand sum. They really should say uh, right-hand Riemann sum. It should be trademarked, right? It should be like Riemann, and then they should have like a little TM, right? or like a little R for registered trademark, right? Okay, so anyway, the right-hand sum, as you'll often see it on the AP test, we are using six equal rectangles again, okay? So again, the delta X is going to be one. All right, right-hand sum, if you think it's just like this, it really is. So when you raise the roof, all right, delta X is one. So when you go across one, when you raise the roof, you make sure that the right corner of the building touches the parabola, right, like that. And then we'll take this one out, okay? Delta x equals one, right corner touches the parabola. Delta x equals one, right corner hits the parabola. Okay, delta x equals one, right corner hits the parabola. Delta x equals one, right corner touches the parabola. And then finally, delta x equals one, all the way up to 17, right corner touches the parabola. And again, you get a little bit of above or overestimation, and then you get a couple of underestimations. Is it a rough balance? Yes. But then Riemann took this uniformity of justifying either left or right corner and took it to a whole new level, as you will see in the history break, what he exactly did. So the area of these six rectangles would be the area roughly under the curve, which would be one by two is two plus one by one is one, plus one by two is two, uh, plus one by five is a five, plus a one by 10 is 10, and then plus a one by 17 is 17. All right, and this will probably be a little bit of an overestimation because there, there are more over rectangles than under rectangles, so that makes sense. 
All right, so we add them all together. Uh, I was hoping for a couple of fives to make a 10. I didn't get it, although there is a two plus two plus one makes five plus five is 10, and you could use those. So that's 10 total, 20, 37. Good night, that's not even close. Now remember we only used six equal rectangles here. Uh, that's just for the simplicity of doing this on the AP test because they will ask questions like this on the AP test. Um, so they actually want you to do just basic math, base times height. I mean, it really is just almost middle school math, right? Uh, but they do want you to do these questions. And of course, they want you to also find the exact area of 30, which I'll be teaching you in the next lesson. Now, before we head into our history break, remember we only used six equal rectangles to make this simpler. Riemann could have used more like 100, 600, 1,000. Imagine how painstaking that would be because then you'd have to go by decimals, right? Instead of plugging in uh, 6 to the equation and getting a height of 17, imagine having to pl plug in like 5.99 into that equation and do it before the era of a calculator and get the height of that little rectangle and all these little skinny rectangles, right? But it would be better. And that kind of leads to our idea. The exact area is really something I've been hinting at the entire lesson. And that is if any great calculus student out there is thinking, what if I could put infinite rectangles in there? Because calculus is all about like trying to get to infinity and, and trying to think big instead of finite, okay? Especially in the second semester. So that is correct. That is how Riemann did find this out. If you could get infinite rectangles or partitions in there and you can get the width or delta x to squeeze down so tiny that they were microscopically thin, and essentially like gravitating to zero, infinitesimally skinny, if you will. Infinite is big, infinitesimal is small. So if you can get them to be infinitesimally skinny and put infinite rectangles in there, you can get the exact area. It's just that no mathematician had enough knowledge to figure it out until the great Riemann came along. Thank goodness he was born. Thank goodness he survived childhood at a time when plagues would sweep through Europe and kill all kinds of children and old people. Thank goodness we got this guy to survive because he changed manufacturing and engineering forever. All right, let's go into a history break. And now you can fill out this last little section at the bottom about Riemann. But first you can fill out the boxes on the front page and then we'll go and, and end off with the last page here. first addressed by Eudoxus, an ancient Greek mathematician still ranked number 10 to this day. He was actually the top ranked mathematician until 250 BC when Archimedes emerged. Around 225 BC, Archimedes developed the circumscribed rectangles as a way to find area under the curve. He still ranked number six all time. Archimedes was actually ranked the greatest mathematician for 2,000 years finally dethroned on July the 5th, 1687, when Sir Isaac Newton publishes his famous book that introduced calculus to the world. In 1753, a 46-year-old oiler used a trapezoidal sum. He, of course, is ranked number one to this day. innovative method to attempt to find the area under a curve with a systematic method that would lead to integration. He's ranked number 12 all time. In 1854, Riemann showed that the exact area under any curve could be found by using not 10, not 20, not 100, but infinite rectangles, earning his PhD for this discovery. It's perhaps the most prestigious PhD in math history the person who discovered how to use infinite rectangles to find exact area of any space. The number 10 most important world event would result from his discovery known as the Industrial Revolution, beginning in 1760, but truly escalating in 1870. Oh, 
know it's an edge. I think they're heavy. For specific points. 32, uh, 33, 34, so we'll do the, 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 rep, the, rep, the reptile. Now, let's flip it, uh, flip it a little bit back. Back in uh, 370 BC, uh, you really should say Rimanshom. It's, it's, it's Rimanshom. 